everyone. Welcome to the wrestler's class. And um, we have a very exciting speaker with us this morning. Before we get started, let's uh, read a brief passage of scripture and then uh, I'll introduce our speaker. <clears throat> this is a little passage from uh, Colossians chapter 3. Um, and this is, this is uh, talking about slaves, but it really is servants or employees. And if you think of it in those terms, it says, employees, you must always try to obey your earthly masters. Try to please them at all times, and not just when you think they are watching. <laughs> Honor the Lord and serve your masters with your whole heart. Do your work willingly, as though you were serving the Lord himself and not just your earthly master. In fact, the Lord Christ is the one you are really serving, and you know that he will reward you. But he has no favors. He will punish evil people just as they deserve. So uh, when you are with unbelievers, always make good use of the time. Be pleasant and hold their interest when you speak the message. Choose your words carefully and be ready to give answers to anyone who has questions. That's the word of the Lord. Now, uh, let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for this time together, this fellowship. We thank you for our speaker. And and uh, we thank you for the encouragement in your spirit that helps us to be uh, to grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen. So our speaker today is Hugh Welkel. And he is the uh, executive director of the Institute of Faith, Work, and Economics, based here in Northern Virginia, uh, in the D.C. area. And Hugh brings a unique combination of executive responsibility, creative educational administration, and technical innovation for over 30 years of diverse business experience. And he was just telling me something about his business experience and how uh, he has tied that together with theological training. Almost a decade ago, he stepped out of a successful business career in the IT industry to share his experience of turning around unprofitable companies and then he got involved in the local base of the Reformed Theological uh, Seminary's struggling Washington, D.C. campus, where he served as executive director there and guest professor for seven years, getting it back on track. So that was the kind of way that he applied his business skills. Uh, in addition to his business acumen, Hugh has a passion and expertise for helping individuals integrate their faith and their vocational calling. He is the author of How Then Should We Work? Rediscovering the Biblical Doctrine of Work, released in May 2012. Hugh has been published by a wide variety of media outlets from the Washington Post the Global, the, to the Gospel Coalition and By Faith Magazine. He has also been a guest on Moody Radio Network's In the Market with Janet Parshall, Salem Radio Network, IRN USA Radio Network, and Truth in Action Ministries, Truth That Transforms, and the Jack Riccardi Show, among other shows. A native Floridian, Hugh earned a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from the University of Florida and an MA in Religion from Reformed Theological Seminary. Hugh and his wife, Leslie, this is Leslie here. Nice to see you, too. I'm... Now they live in Loudoun County, Virginia. As an ordained ruling elder in the Presbyterian Church in America, he serves in leadership at McLean Presbyterian Church. Uh, in what spare time he has, Hugh enjoys hiking, golfing, and restoring old sports cars. So uh, he just was telling me about a, a new uh, a plot and a house that he designed and built in uh, Loudoun County, where uh, now he has space for his family. And uh, how many kids do you have? We have two daughters, but we have two grandchildren who will be joining us. Okay. <laughs> two daughters and two grandchildren. Hey, so do we. Yeah. How about that? Just great. Like that. That's great. Well, so so Hugh, come on up here and share with us. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and I, I hope to make this next hour well worth your time. So I thank you for getting up early on a cold, rainy morning to come in. I um, want to talk to you a little bit today about what I would consider one of the cornerstones of, of the Reformation. And it's a cornerstone that's kind of been forgotten by Christians, I think, in the 21st century. Uh, and another um, 
short several months, we'll be celebrating the 500th anniversary uh, of uh, Luther nailing the 95 Theses to the door of, of the Church of Wittenberg. And um, I would make an argument, if I had the time, and I think I could, and I've done it in other places, that one of the cornerstones of the Reformation was the idea that our work, no matter what that work might be, is important to God. See, in Luther's day, people thought that the only work that was really spiritual was the work of the priest. And Luther said, one of his famous quotes was, the work of the milkmaid is just as important to God as the work of the priest. That was heresy in his day. It's heresy in a lot of churches still today, unfortunately. So one of the things we do at the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics is we try to talk to, to pastors, to uh, educators, and even Christians in general about the importance of their work. And in fact, uh, Art Lisley was here, who works for me at the Institute, was here about six months ago, and he told me he talked a little bit about this idea of the importance of work. So what I want to do is step beyond that and talk not necessarily about the what, but about the why. Now, to get kind of into what I'm thinking about when I say why, I want to play you a short clip. Um, the the, the video is not terribly good, but you'll get, you'll get the sense of it's about three minutes long. And um, it's by a guy named Michael Jr., who is actually a, a, an African American Christian comic. Now, those three things don't seem to go together at all, but, uh, but anyway, let, let me play you a little bit for what he says about the why. The phrase is called, How Do I Know? And a lot of times when people hear the phrase, How Do I Know? The next thing they say is, What? How do I know what? But the key really isn't to know what. The key is to know why. Because when you know your why, you have options on what your what can be. For instance, my why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. My what is standing up comedy. My what is writing books. My what can be going out with some friends to eat. In fact, another what that has moved me towards my why is a, a web series that we have out now called Break Time. So every Wednesday at 3 o'clock, you should subscribe to the, to the channel. Uh, we do a series called Break Time on YouTube. So 3 o'clock, we drop a new episode. One episode in particular I'm about to show you a clip to. We were in, uh, we were in Winston-Salem. So Break Time, this is how it works. I travel the country. I do stand-up comedy probably an hour, hour and a half at an event. And in the middle of my show, I'll just sit down and start talking to the audience. And funny just happens. Or I'll meet somebody who's really interesting. So I met this one guy, and he said that he teaches music <coughs> at a school. I was like, all right, you teach music. You know, uh, and sing. And then uh, I'm just going to show you a clip. Check it. So you're a musical director? Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so... Um, let me get a couple. Let me get a couple bars of like uh, Amazing Grace. Can you move the first part of that. Go ahead. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That rock is sick. You know what I'm saying? Jail. You got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the good version real quick. You know which version I'm talking about. Just see if that. The, the, the video is not 
not the best, but the point he's trying to make is simply this. That if you know your why, it changes everything. Your why is what sustains you, what drives you, it's what the passion behind what it is that you do. And I fear that most Christians today have lost their why. It's still there in the Bible. God still wants us to tap into it, but we've forgotten what it is. So I want to talk to you about that today, and really how it ties back to what we do every day, and what we call our work. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to switch um, to another gear here a little bit, and I'm going to talk about two or three different things that may seem somewhat uh, uh, disjoint, okay? Bear with me, and I promise I'll tie it all together at the end, okay? So, <clears throat> what you think first would be, picture a refugee city, huge refugee city, stretches out in every direction. This refugee city is on the edge of one of the greatest cities in the world. But these refugees have seen things people should never have to see. They've experienced things they should never have to experience. They've seen a, a, an invading army come into the city, kill their relatives and friends. They've seen this invading army all but destroy their beloved city. Even their place of worship was absolutely destroyed. And then to make matters worse, this invading army gathered up a, a, a large number of the best and the brightest of their city and, and took them a thousand miles away from them. And now they are encamped on the edge of this great city. Everybody's hanging in suspension, wanting to know where the city is. Okay, so the time is the 5th century BC. The city the great city of Babylon. And the exiles, as you probably already guessed by now, the children of Israel. Now it's interesting, Nebuchadnezzar had a strategy, unlike most of the people who conquered the cities of his day. Instead of taking the people and making them slaves, he would take the best of the brightest, those who would be leaders in the future, he would bring them back to Babylon, and instead of enslaving them, he would let them freely go down into the city. Now, they weren't free to leave, but they were free to go down into the city to be assimilated into the culture of Babylon. Brilliant strategy, okay? One which I, I'm going to argue later is being used by, by powers out there today to deaden, or blunt at least, most Christians' ability to affect people around them. Um, so we have these refugees on the edge of the city, and they're incredibly depressed, as you can imagine. They feel like, you know, only if we could get back to the good old days. Things have gone so terribly wrong. To give you an insight on how bad they thought, I mean, how bad they felt, let me play you a, a, a little bit of a clip from um, one of the Psalms. It was one of the Psalms writing about the, uh, the exile, and you'll get a sense of, of, of the mindset. Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and went when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. 
In fact, there are what we find later are false prophets in the midst. And these false prophets are saying, look, don't go down to the city. Let's stay out here on, on, in this camp and wait because God's going to raise up a giant army to come and free us from these terrible Babylonians. And he'll smite the Babylonians and do all that stuff in the Psalms and, and we'll be victors once again and we'll be able to go back home. So they wait and they wait and they wait. And one day, not an army comes, but a letter. A letter from the prophet Jeremiah. Now, the prophet Jeremiah was an old dude, so he was left behind. Right? But he sends him a letter. And he says some interesting things in the letter. But he basically tells him, look, i got some good news for you and some bad news. The good news is, God still loves you and has a plan for your life. The bad news is, you're not going anywhere anytime soon. You better get used to being in Babylon. Let me play a little bit of what he says in that letter. The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Now, if you look in the Hebrew Bible, where it says peace and prosperity, that's only only one word in the Hebrew Bible. Do you know what it is? Shalom. Shalom. Yeah. And actually, down where it says, if you prosper, that's really the word shalom, and uh, you too will prosper. So literally what it says is seek, or probably a better translation is work for the shalom of the city that I've carried you in exile. Because if it has shalom, you too will have shalom. Now, we typically translate that word shalom as peace. But that translation is far too weak a translation. It means much, much more than that. In fact, I would argue, and we've had some of the best scholars in America, the biblical scholars in America, write for us about this. So it's just not me saying this. But the idea of shalom is one of the threads, one of the themes that's woven through the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. It's one that we have kind of forgotten in the church. Um, for example, the Old Testament prophets, they dreamed of a new age in which crookedness would be made straight, when rough places would be made plain, when the foolish would be made wise, and the wise humble. They dreamed of a time when the desert would flower, the mountains would stream with red wine, a time when weeping would be heard no more. People would work in peace, their work having meaning and point. The lion would lay down with the lamb. All nature would be fruitful, benign, and filled with wonder upon wonder. All humans would be knit together in brotherhood and sisterhood. This is what they call shalom. Shalom has a much broader mindset or, or definition that encompasses so much more than just the idea of peace. Um, the best definition I've come across is one from um, a guy named Plantica, um, Cornelius Plantica. He's got a brother that many people know, but this is Cornelius wrote this. He said this, Shalom is the webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight. Shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, and delight, a rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied and natural gifts fruitfully employed. Shalom, in other words, is the way things ought to be. The full flourishing of human life in all respects, just as God intended. Interesting enough, I would argue that every human being that's ever walked the face of this earth understood that idea of shalom. Deep down in their heart, they knew there was something about the way things were supposed to be. This is why when, they, when people look at a natural disaster, Christians or non-Christians, they're horrified if you see these tornadoes come kill all these people. Or they see a natural disaster like a terrorism event. And what's the first thing people cry out? It's not the way it's supposed to be. Because see, deep down in every one of us, God has given us this, this glimpse, this desire for this, for this thing called shalom. Right? Um, let me give you some examples how shalom is used in the Old Testament and how we misinterpret it and in the New Testament. For example, around Christmas time, one of our favorite passages is Jesus is the Prince of Peace. No, he's not. That's really not true. And the way we think about it is not true. 
Jesus is the Prince of Shalom. Jesus is not a prince that's going to come back and stop fighting. Jesus is the prince that's going to come back and make all things new. He's going to come back and restore the entire creation back the way it was supposed to be. See, that's much more than peace, right? Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, i give you a lot. Let me give you one more in the New Testament. New Testament's obviously written in Greek, not in Hebrew, so you don't find the word Shalom. But there's a word that when most of the New Testament writers wrote it, it's the word Irene, when we get the woman's name, Irene. When they wrote that, we translate this piece as well most of the time, but when they wrote that, they were thinking Shalom. So the same, uh, um, the same understanding of Shalom. So go back and start reading through the New Testament. And we're, read that word peace. Plug in this definition of Shalom. It begins to change everything. Let me give one example. The Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Okay. So we think blessed are those who come and do reconciliation or keep people from fighting or something like that. That's not what that means at all. What it's saying here is Blessed are those who come back and do their work, somehow reweave shalom, somehow give people a glimpse of the way things are supposed to be, and, and things like mercy and justice, and, 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 and through all the realms, right? Much, much more powerful than just our understanding of peace. Um, there's a guy who has uh, done some work for us named um, Jonathan Pennington. He's a PhD scholar over at uh, Southern um, Seminary in Louisville. He, he writes this. He says, human flourishing alone is able to encompass all human activity and goals because there is nothing so natural and inescapable as the desire to live and to live in peace, security, love, and happiness. These are not merely cultural values or the desire of certain people at a certain period of time. All human behavior, when analyzed deeply enough, will be found to be motivated by the desire for life and flourishing, both individually and corporately. Shalom is a powerful, powerful concept that we need to understand in today's world. Interesting enough, there's perfect shalom in the garden before the fall. In the new heaven and new earth, when God sets up his kingdom, where we'll live forever in a physical place with him, there'll be perfect shalom. Right? So really, Shalom bookends creation. It's there at the beginning, it's there at the end. Uh, interesting enough, if we go back to that passage by Jeremiah, and really think a little bit about what he's doing. What he's doing, he's reminding the Israelites that just because they're in bondage, they still have a purpose to their life. There's still something God intended them to do. And I would argue from the very beginning, God intended his people to do this. And if we go back to the to, to Genesis and look at the creation story, we'll see in Genesis 128, after the song still on the sixth day of creation, after God has created Adam and Eve, he comes to them and says, Let me tell you what your job description is. Let me tell you why I made you and put you here. This is what he says. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Now, he comes to tell them, I want you to do two things. I want you to fill the earth with my images. And the second thing, I want you to subdue the earth. Now, the word subdue there is the Hebrew word kabosh. And literally, in that context, it means to make the earth an incredible place for people to flourish, to, to enjoy shalom. That's literally what it meant. Now, you know, if, if um, um, I think if, if um, Jeremiah had been there, he would have told him, look, in fact, I think he tells him this in the letter. First of all, I want you to realize that even though you're an exile, you still have to keep doing this. This is what you were made to do. What does he say? He tells them to build houses, to continue to have families. He reminds them, fill the earth with my images. The second thing he does is tells them, now I know you're not in charge. Let me show you what subduing the earth looks like when you're next time. It looks like working for the shalom of the city. Because only way you're going to have shalom is if they have shalom. 
incredible passage, which has incredible impact, I think, for believers in the 21st century. That what he's telling them is, don't forget, you need to keep doing this. That echoes down through the centuries and reminds us, we've got to keep doing this. And really, as we think about today, familiar with God's image, we have to change that a little bit, really realizing this was written before the fall, right? Okay, so what are we called to do today? Fill the earth with God's what? Redeemed images, right? That's what Jesus came to do. That's what we're called to do. And the second part, which I would argue that Christians have completely forgotten about, but Martin Luther and Calvin and the Reformers really understood, was that subduing the earth means going out and, and working for the shalom of the city. Working to bring flourishing to, 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 to the communities that we interact with no matter what God's called us to do. Now here's the interesting thing. Um, there's um, Nancy Piercy in a book called Total Truth writes this about this passage. She says this, the first phrase, be fruitful and multiply, means to develop the social world, build families, churches, schools, cities, governments, and laws. The second phrase, subdue the earth, means to harness the natural world, to plant crops, build bridges, design computers, compose music, this passage is sometimes called the cultural mandate because it tells us that our original purpose was to create cultures, build civilizations, nothing less. You see, the garden was perfect in the beginning, but it wasn't finished. If Adam and Eve had never sinned, would they have just stayed in the garden for the rest of eternity? No. They would have gone out into the rest of the world and done what? They did into the garden. Right? They would have gone and done things. They would have filled it with God's images. And they would have subdued it. They would have made it an incredible place for human beings to flourish. This is what God is calling us to do. That's the why. This is part of the why behind the what that we're called to do. Now, uh, let me shift gears again a little bit. <coughs> I was getting to, and many of you know and have heard, I'm sure, uh, talks about in, in his book called The Call. He wrote this probably 18, 19 years ago. He says in the call that all of us, that the primary calling of all Christians, we share this, this primary calling, is to become disciples of Christ. And this is really a call to do, excuse me, a call to be, to become a, a disciple of Christ. But then he goes on to say that that calling works itself out in what he calls four uh, secondary callings. Our call to the church, our call to family, our call to community, our call to vocation. And this is a call to do. This is where this is where we work out our salvation in fear and trembling. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we become who it is that God's called us to become. Right? This is where we do the works that without which our faith is in vain. Right? So faith produces works, and this is the works that we do. Based on his original calling to become his disciple. Um, what we do at the Institute, and I think this is very biblical, we say all the work that you do in these four areas, the work that you do in your church here, the work that you do in your family, the work that you do in your community, the work that you do in your vacation, vocation, all those works, paid and unpaid, when, when all kind of gathered together, that's what the New Testament calls stewardship. Another word that the church has lost, a, a recent poll was done and asked, what does stewardship mean? What, what do you think like people said, Christians said? Giving yeah, giving money to the church. No. In the New Testament, stewardship meant working in all these four spheres to the glory of God, right? So we have to recapture this idea of stewardship is working, and, and we would go on to argue that the work in those four areas is all important. Now, the work in those four areas is going to change as you go through seasons in your, of your life, right? Uh, the percentage, but nevertheless, we're all called to do something in those four areas at any given point in our lives. Now, flourishing, or shalom, is tied at the hip with this idea of stewardship. That it's through our work that we bring about flourishing. It's through the things that we do in those four spheres that we bring about shalom to the communities that we engage through our lives, whether it's our family, our church, the people we know at work. You know, if you're retired, you, you know, retirement is really not in the scripture, so <laughs> retirement is basically... Right? And listen, I lived in Florida. I saw people for years come down to Florida to retire. And what had happened to them all? They died. Most of them fairly quickly. I mean, listen, I love to play golf, but you can't play golf seven days a week. They, you know, they just don't work. God wants you to be fruitful. And that might mean, you know, we were talking.
talking earlier about volunteering into places or, or working on other projects. You know, you've made enough money where you don't have to be paid. That's great. You can move into to the nonprofit world. I, I work in the nonprofit world right now. And trust me, it'd be nice to, be, to be, not have to be paid because <laughs> it's very hard to raise money in the nonprofit world. Nevertheless, we have to understand this idea of stewardship and, and this idea of flourishing or shloom are tied at the hip. You know, you can't do one without the other. And in fact, I would even go on to say that this idea of stewardship implies an expectation of human achievement. If God intends us to go out and build civilizations, that means we have to invent things, we have to do things that bring about flourishing to our communities. And many of us are called to do that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the most amazing things. There, there are movements in the church today that say, no, we need to withdraw from the, from the, from the, from the church, I mean, excuse me, withdraw from the culture and just be the church and, and go be like monasteries and stuff like that. No, that's not at all what the scripture talks about. And, and to me, that is going off in, in the absolute wrong direction. Um, now, let me add one more idea, and then I'll try to wrap all this up. We talk a lot at the Institute about something we call the four-chapter gospel. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Creation explains the way things were. The fall explains the way things are. Redemption explains the way things could be, and restoration shows the way things are going to be. And for us, this is a great model to understand the, the larger picture of God's redemptive story. Because one of the problems is when we study the Bible, by necessity, what do we do? We chop it up into little pieces. Right? But always keeping this model in mind always helps you remember where the little pieces we're reading fit into this bigger story. One of the big problems in the Christian culture of the 21st century is that we've taken this four-chapter gospel and we've truncated it to two chapters. All we talk about is the fall and redemption. And here's the problem about it. And both of those things are true, but if all, you spend all your time talking about fall and redemption, the gospel becomes very inwardly focused. Dallas Willard says when we do this, we make the gospel the gospel of sin management. Right? And we don't see the bigger picture. See, when we leave off the first chapter, we don't know what we were created to do. You know, that whole idea about the cultural mandate. We, we forget about that. And if we leave off the last chapter, we don't realize what God is going to do with us when we get done with all this. Right? Um, and so by truncating the four chapter gospel into two chapters, We've caused one of the most damaging things in the Christian culture, and that's we've locked ourselves into this idea that there are only some things that are important and other things aren't. Often this is expressed by the spiritual, secular divide. Right? So we think some things we do during the day are spiritual, some things we do are secular. And if you don't believe me, um, I've got a graph in a minute, I, I, I'll go back to it. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very damaging way to view things because the scripture tells us everything is spiritual. And everything we do is important to God. Now, so what we have to do, we have to add these two chapters back so we know what we were created to do and we truly understand where we're going to end up. A friend of mine named Richard Pratt says this. He says, we think that Jesus came to forgive our sins, make our souls sparkle, to sprinkle us with peace and joy so that we can sprout wings and when we die, grab a heart and join an eternal choir. Nothing would be farther from the truth. The point of Christianity, uh, uh, writes uh, N.T. Wright, the point of Christianity is not to go to heaven when you die. Rather, it is the putting of the whole creation to rights. It's participating in God's redemptive plan for his creation. That's what we're called to do. That's what we were made to do from the very beginning. Okay? Um, We've got to come to this understanding that there is no secular spiritual divide. That all work is important to God. Some work's not spiritual. Listen, every time I talk, I have to repent. I don't know how many years I told people. Did you hear about John Smith? He quit his job at the bank to go into full-time Christian service. And that meant he was either like a pastor or a, a missionary, right? There's no such thing. Now, all work is full-time Christian service. Every one of you is employed in the full-time service of Christ in this world, in this time. Okay. Um, when I was in college, this is what it looked like, right? Well, we, I, I call this the spiritual secular divide. Jobs over here, ministry jobs, those were the spiritual jobs. Everything else on the inside was lesser jobs. Right? Look, I struggled at, at a point in my life, particularly in the early 90s, because I didn't feel like what I was doing.
doing when I was on the computer games. I didn't feel like I cared about what I did. I felt like I was a second class citizen in the kingdom. And the guys who were on the cutting edge, what was really happening, were pastors and missionaries. Now it's interesting, I go and speak to a lot of Christian colleges these days, and one of the first things I ask them, I say, think about what you did yesterday. And, and this doesn't work on Monday, it has to be another day besides Monday. So think about what you did yesterday. What percentage of the spiritual and what percentage of the secular? And guess what? I've done that to hundreds, maybe thousands of kids by now. And then I'll go around and ask, I've never heard anyone say 100% spiritual. But when, but when, as the passage we read earlier, and Paul tells the Corinthians the same thing, whether you eat or drink, do everything to the glory of God. You see, in the Hebrew language, there's not a word for spiritual in, in this context. Why is that? Were they not spiritual people? No. They, it was, they needed no reason to differentiate spiritual from secular because they knew everything was spiritual. Right? Paul saw that clearly. The early church saw it. It gets lost in the medieval church. It's brought back by the, 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 um, the reformers. And, and you know, we lost it again. So, so we need, as we think about this 500 anniversary of the Reformation, we need to think about how we bring this understanding of God's scripture back into the lives of, of, of believers where they can live it daily and make a difference. Here's the interesting thing. Here's what it looks like to college students today, right? You know, they're cool jobs that are kind of changed the world job. Those jobs are spiritual, right? And, and the rest of these aren't. And the interesting, what two aren't up there anymore? Yeah, none of them believe they want, they're being called to be a pastor. None of them believe they're being called to missionaries, right? But God's still calling people to be pastors and missionaries. And I, I could go on with that, but you can get the point. Um, Something we need to we need to really work against. I used to work for Microsoft, and, and this is a poster we ha we had it in, uh, on our wall, right? <clears throat> change the world to go home. This should be our motto as believers. You know, change the world to go home. We're here to make a difference, to be salt and light, to, to have an impact on the people around us, right? And I would argue that if you look at the history of Westernization, now interesting thing, you look at most history books today. Christianity has been written before the out of it, and particularly the impact Christianity's had on the history of Western civilization. You will not find it in most secular history books. Now, there are a few good authors that are writing about this, and, and, and this stuff's very profound, but for the most part, they, they've taken this out. But I would argue that if you go back and look at Western civilization, almost everything that's been done good, significant, forget the last hundred years where we've kind of lost our way, but before that, was done by believers who understood that their calling was to come through Shalom, to somehow bring about flourishing in, in, their, in, their, um, in, their, in their sphere of reference, right, or sphere of influence. This would include things like uh, great inventions, right, great art, great music, the, the abolishment of slavery, um, uh, women's rights, I mean, make a list. It's all done by believers. I mean, and you can just you can name after name after name. You start thinking about this. To, for, for example, with um, Will Force and Florence Nightingale, both of them were, were very committed believers and did what they did out of their commitment to God to bring about flourishing. We've got to get back to that if we're going to make a difference. Now, let me let me wrap all this up and, and see if I can pull it all together. We believe that Jesus healed the blind man, right? I'm a good Presbyterian, so all you have to do is nod your head. You're not saying amen, and just nod your head, so I know you're with me. We believe that he fed the 5,000 when he was there on the face of the earth. Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus feed everyone that was hungry when he was here? No. Or even in Israel? No, he didn't. Did he heal everyone in Israel that was sick? No, of course not. Could he have? Of course he could have. He's the son of God. He could have done anything he wanted to. Then the real question we should ask ourselves is why didn't he? Right? Now, Art Lindsay, who, who has a PhD in and, and, and theology is a great theologian. If he was here this morning, he would tell us Jesus was just demonstrating his power and authority as the Son of God on earth. No, that's right. That's, a, that's absolutely right. But there's another reason I think that we've missed. When Jesus healed the blind man, let me, let me ask you another question first, though. What of the four chapter gospel, remember I talked about creation, fall, redemption, restoration. And I said that creation was about the way things were, the fall explains the way things are. Redemption, which was the chapter that we're in, it's also the chapter that Jesus was in when he walked on the face of the earth. It's about what? It's about showing people the way things could be. And then the last chapter is showing about the way things are going to be. So if Jesus is in the third chapter of redemption, showing people the way things could be, 
by giving them a glimpse of what Shalom looks like. When he feeds the 5,000, he's showing people there could be a time when no one's hungry. When he heals the blind man, he's showing them, he's showing them, excuse me, he's showing them there could be a time when no one's blind, right? And it's his disciples, we're called to go do likewise. We're called to go out into the world. And in those four spheres in which we work, to bring about shalom to, to the context in which we work, giving people a glimpse of the way things could be, giving them a picture of shalom so that they might understand what it is that Jesus wants to do with this world, with this creation. Not only he wants to, he's going to do, and what he wants to do in their lives. Powerful, powerful idea. We have to stop being like the exiles of Babylon who were crying out for something that, for, for, for a relief that wasn't going to come, who wanted to go back to the way things were, right? We have to understand that we are exiles today. You know, this is no longer a, a Christian nation by any stretch of the imagination. We don't live in a, even in a Christian friendly culture anymore. But nevertheless, like Daniel. See, the interesting thing is when that letter was read, there were four guys in the, in the audience. We know one of them by his Hebrew name, Daniel. The other three we know by their Nebuchadnezzar or names, or their, their Babylonian names, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And those four young men said, we believe what Jeremiah is telling us. And we believe that's the call on our lives. And we're going to go and we're going to work for the peace and prosperity of the city, no matter what it cost us. Because we know the only way we'll try to find real shalom in our lives is to bring shalom to this city. That's what we need to do. We need to follow in their footsteps. And we need to teach others. I mean, I look at this, at this audience, and, and all of you have great influence on a lot of the younger people coming up, whether they be your kids or grandkids or friends. Or, you know, you use that influence to begin to show them that this is why you're here if you're a believer. This is what God's called you to do. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, questions? Um, we've got some time. Uh, I'll be glad to answer questions on this or, or anything else that I've touched on. I've touched on a lot of stuff. Um, I think uh, a lot of people get a job because, I mean, they just yep. need to do something yep, to survive. Some. That's right. And a lot of people don't really like their work. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I mean, I've done, as a student, I've done jobs that <laughs> I wouldn't yep. want to do with my whole life, yep. but yep. a lot Me of too. people do. I mean, yep. like working on an right. assembly line, and um, I mean, people yep. just are yep. paid for jobs. And, and, and I hear a lot of this from millennials particularly, right? Because they have been taught, as they've been growing up, that... Um, that they would be ultimately successful in a, in a fast amount of time. You know, I call it the sticker syndrome. They've been given so many stickers and so many you know, trophies for just, for just showing up, right? When you get in the real world, showing up is not, that's just part of the battle, right? It's the first step in the right direction, but then you've got to, you've got to apply yourself. And um, so, I, so I hear this question a lot, right? Get away from, 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 from the younger generation. And what I tell them is, okay, let's go back to the four chapter gospel. This is why that four chapter gospel is so powerful. I've written a little booklet on it called All Things New that you can download from our website for free if you'd like to hear more about it. It kind of explains how this thing, but it's been such a great framework because what chapter are we in? We're in the chapter of redemption. We still live in a fallen world. I mean, Jesus has come. He, he's, he's begun his kingdom. You know, it will be consummated when he comes back again. When he comes back again, he's moving us into the last chapter. The chapter of redemption. And in the chapter of redemption, see, people don't realize this. We're going to live in a physical new heaven and new earth, in physical and resurrection bodies. Go read um, um, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul talks extensively about our resurrection bodies. That, you know, when we die, our souls go to heaven to wait the great resurrection. And at that time, our souls will be rejoined with our resurrection bodies. There'll be the great judgment. And he'll separate the, the, the wheat from the chaff. And, and, and the wheat will live with him in a new heaven and new earth. It's a physical place. And I would argue, we'll have work there. And people go, wait a minute, where did you get that? Right? Go, read, uh, go read some of the things that the prophets wrote about when they wrote about the new heaven and the new earth. See, this, once again, you leave off that chapter, we don't realize all this. One of my favorite 
passages um, comes out of the book of, 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 of Micah. When Micah talks about how we will pound our swords into plowshares and we'll turn our spears into pruning hooks, right? People read that and say, oh, there you go. And then they've had an earth that won't be in war. That's true. But what are we doing? We're making implements of war into implements of work. Yeah, they'll be, they'll be work. And it'll be perfect work. The job that you have and you have not will fit you, fit you so perfectly. Think about this. All of us have had this experience that we were doing something sometimes in, our, in one of our jobs and we had just a couple minutes where everything just worked perfectly. We were on. It was just, I mean, you would just say, well, I'm, wow, you know. Every minute of every hour of every day for the rest of eternity in the new heaven earth, that's how work will be. So there are no perfect jobs in, in this fallen world. And so you have to realize that, right? Some are more perfect than others. I tell them, a lot of the, the young people I talk to, I say, look, your biggest problem is you don't even know what you're good at now. You've got to go work a bunch of different jobs to figure out how God's gifted you. What, what are you, what, you know, I, I, I doubt many of us, and there are a few people that somehow or another, they were really fortunate. They know right away what God's called them to do. And, uh, but I, was, I was listening to a guy to talk the other day who, who, who is a believer now, I believe. And he's, he's one of the, the top uh, college football coaches in the United States. And he said he was with his dad on the sideline when he was six years old and saw a guy coaching football and said, that's what I'm going to do. Now look, I'm almost, I'm, I'll am almost i turn 65 this year. I'm still not sure what I'm supposed to do. I'm still trying to figure it out, right? So some people somehow get it, but they're the minority, right? So most of us, but what we always have to realize, there aren't any perfect jobs here. Even the best job that perfectly suits you, the one I'm doing now, I would say, running the institute is really has a high level of, 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 of uh, um, traction with who I am and who God's made me to be. It's still hard. I still struggle uh, because we're in a fallen world, and that's just the way it's going to be. So I, I encourage people to go, you know, particularly young people, go do as many things as you can. Some of them are really going to be terrible. I've had some terrible jobs. Uh, my wife jokes because I, I, and this is crazy that I even thought about doing this, probably, I might have been in college, I thought, okay, I'm going to save every business card for every, every company I ever work for. And then when I get done, of course, I had the wrong idea of retirement back then, but I said, when I retire, I'm going to put them all in one picture thing. I've got a box now that's full of cards of companies I work for, and I've started the second box. And I said, it's going to take a whole wall to put all those up because I work so many different places. But, um, yeah, so, so I, it, it's, it's, it's an issue. But understand that no matter what God's called you to do, you go and you do the best that you can. And that's all you can do. You, know, you go to try to work in such a way that brings Him glory and serves the common good and furthers His kingdom in this place and this time. That's, you know, but, but always understanding the why behind it is this reweaving shalom. That that's what we're here to do. We're here to make this place flourish. And the more we do that, the more we glorify God, that's how it's all tied together. Another question. Yes, sir. You mentioned earlier on about uh, the danger of assimilation. Yes, yes, yeah. 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 yeah, see, I think one of the biggest problems with the church today is we're being sucked into the culture. You know, we're, we're the proverbial frog in the pot of uh, water that the heat's been slowly turned up. You know the story, right? Put a frog in a pot of water. If it's hot, he'll just jump out. But if it's cold, and you put him in there, slowly turn the temperature up a little bit of time, he will cook. And that's what the church said that, right? We're cooked. Because we haven't realized what we were called to do. And I think the other problem, once again, goes back to this four chapter gospel. We don't have this unifying vision of God's redemptive plan for his creation. I mean, I mean, Paul writes the whole creation groans in anticipation of what? Of God finishing his plan and all things being made new. And when we don't see that, the scripture loses its authority. And that's where we are today in the world. Uh, the, 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 you know, the 20, 30 something generation, they go through scripture and it's like walking through a, a cafeteria, right? They say, I'll take a little bit of that. Oh, but I don't like that, so I'll just pass on that. I'll take a little bit of that truth because I like that because that helps me. But that other truth, that's too hard. And if I do that, I'll be ostracized. So I don't want to do that. And, and, and so what's happened is we've, once again, we've truncated that four chapter gospel into two chapters and, and we've made the gospel all about us, right? And as a result, we don't have this bigger idea of the authority of Scripture, which is the only thing that keeps us from being assimilated by the culture. Most Christians today are, are basically, uh, I say most, most younger Christians, I don't even say that, are, are basically uh, biblically illiterate. 
they really don't understand this. Because they haven't read them. Yeah. It's uh, interesting that the four circle. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if you might uh, talk to the fact that um, it seems that um, there are forces within our society, within our culture, that are precluding us from being yeah. in the creation yeah. and restoration yeah. area. They're, they're, they're telling us we have to be fallen redemption only. Yeah, that's exactly right. And they're just trying to force us into that. And we can't do that, right? Okay, let me give you an example. Once again, out of the Daniel story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They go in, work for the peace and prosperity of the city. And, and, and they're very successful. But the one day comes along, and I always often wondered where, where Daniel was that day, right? Was he off? I mean, he must have been out of town on business or something. But, you know, <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar builds a golden statue and then tells them, okay, when, when the trumpet sounds, everybody's got to bow down to it. And those four guys say, you know, we've come in, we've worked to help your government prosper, but there's a limit to what we can do. We can only go so far. At some point, we have to say no. And this is basically Christian civil disobedience. And they said, that's what we're going to do. We're gonna, you know, we've done all this, but, but this is a line we can't cross. Now, what I think we haven't done, because the culture has had such great influence on us, we haven't understood for us individually, where do we draw those lines, right? In your job, in your family, where do you draw those lines? And that's what we've got to get back to doing. But for them, it's very clear. And, and I love what they say to Nebuchadnezzar, you know. They said, you know, God may deliver us from the fiery furnace, or he may not. But he will deliver us from your hand. And that's what we have. We have to take that to heart and understand that as we engage the culture, right, as we go out and do our work and our families and, our, and particularly in the community and our vocational jobs, there's going to be some places where we have a red line and we say, we, we don't cross that red line, regardless of the consequence. I lose my job, so be it, right? And so I think it's one of the things, and, and those red lines are going to be different for all of us, different depending on our situation. I think that, that story is there to, to make us realize that here are guys who are sold out, absolutely sold out to what they, they've been asked to do, right? But they still had to put, draw the red lines and say, I'm not going to step over this. Another one, which is, which is not as obvious to me anyway, is the passage where when they first start working for the king, um, Daniel tells them, you know, we're not going to eat the king's food. Just bring us, you know, vegetables and water. Now, some, for some reason, and I'm not smart enough to understand it, for, for Daniel, that was a red line. I, I, I don't understand what it was, because we know there wasn't anything wrong with eating from the king's table. But for that point, at that time, for where they were, for them, that was a red line, right? And that they would cross. So, the trick is, how do we begin to think through what are the red lines in our lives that we don't cross? Some of them are fairly obvious, some of them are not. But, once again, it comes back to that the culture's told us everything's okay. Well, we know that's not right. So, so where do we begin to draw a line and then make sure that we as God's people don't cross those lines? Okay. So, good question. No, good question. Another question. You guys are too easy. <laughs> well, Art warned me. He said, you guys are really smart and have lots of hard questions. I have another question. Go ahead. If no one else has a question. Okay, we'll this will be the last one. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Make it a good one. Okay. I know someone who, um, uh, he had this um, vision for like his ideal job yep. and as an entrepreneur and he, was, he, um, he launched it and he's been working hard at it and um, it's just not, it's not working out and um, it's just, he's not, the business isn't there. Yep. Um, and it's, but it's his ideal job. It's what he really wants. He to thinks do. it's his ideal job. Well, that's true. <laughs> that's, I'm, I'm just wondering yeah. what what advice would you give? Yeah, me? yeah. That to to, to, to to you know hang in there as long as you can. You know, look at how, where he's failing, right, and see if there's adjustments he can make. Because that's that's the thing about business. You know, you keep trying things until something works. I was a turnaround guy in in in, our, in the IT business and. You know, you're just always trying to figure out what the next thing is. Because, you know, whatever you're doing, after a while, everybody else catches on to it, everybody else does it. So you, you've got to be ahead of the curve. And so you learn, here's the amazing thing about all of us. We learn much more from our failures than we do from our successes. 
and he's a young man probably, you know, so he, has, he hasn't learned that yet, right? And our failures are incredibly valuable. So he needs to see every time he fails. This is the, you know, the, the old um, Edison quote, right? Every time he, 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 he did a light bulb, did work, which happened thousands, thousands of times, that much closer to success. So if this company fails, he's one step closer to starting a company that succeeds. You know, and as a young man, that's an almost very difficult thing to learn. And I, just, I, mean, I was there, I know, right? And, um, but that's, but that is the reality, that, you know, we, we, we learn from our failures. And so then what you have to do is begin to think, okay, well, what does God want me to learn from this? See, I, I tell people this is a hard thing for people to grasp. God is much more interested in me being obedient than being successful or right or any of these things. Does he want us to be successful? Of course he does. But he wants us to be obedient more. That's that's the big thing he wants us to be obedient. It gets back to the fire furnace, right? They were being obedient to what God told them to do. And it was a pretty easy red line for them to draw. It should be pretty easy for us, at least that one. Because one of the Ten Commandments, right? You know? Um, I mean, this many people, I bet a lot of you have been fired. I've been fired a bunch of times. Sometimes because I deserved this, sometimes because I did not. But, but it was, they, they were all excellent learning experiences for me. Sometimes, right in the moment, I wasn't too excited about it, right? But, uh, yeah, so, good question, good question. Let me pray for us, and we'll, we'll leave. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time together. Father, we would pray that you would teach us to be like Daniel, to embrace your call to work for the shalom of the city that God's brought us to. And Father, we, we are in a city that needs to be impacted greatly. And Father, if just the people in this room took this call seriously, we could make a difference in the here and now. So, Father, we would pray that you would teach us how to be salt and light, how to draw the red lines, to be witnesses for you, to be able to do things that would bring you glory, that would also serve the common good and for your kingdom in this place and in this time. In Jesus' name.